Good evening and welcome to episode 335 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantungwa Kumalo. It's the Tuesday edition of the Private Property Podcast. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the family. You are tuned in to the only daily property podcast in South Africa and we help you on all your property needs. Doesn't matter where you are on your property journey, whether you're looking to buy, to sell, to build, or of course, you're still 
still, you know, a tenant and want to get a better sense of how you can uh, move from being a tenant to being a homeowner. This is where you can get all of your property questions answered. And to all our regular viewers on Facebook, on Instagram, as well as on YouTube, welcome back. You know how we do. Every single weekday, you and I have an appointment where I'm always in conversation with a property expert who helps us navigate our property journey. And of course, it's always a great one to also share our own experiences because property is one of those things that's a team sport. Uh, if you want to go you know, very, very far, you want to work with people, you want to make sure that you are in the know and uh, certainly engaging with as many people as you can. And talking about engaging, I can already see the great engagement that we're getting on our Facebook page. Fulufelo uh, Hope saying evening Zama, Mbuhle Madonna, also saying evening Zama, Glad Shrinda's watching, Gosot Fumelo's also watching. And of course, many of you are watching on our Facebook page. Do show us some love down there below. And of course, you know that on our Facebook page, we're running an incredible competition. Uh, that started off with us setting the ambitious goal of wanting to reach 1 million followers on our Facebook page, which we have done thanks to you at home. And of course, we also set out to have 10,000 comments and shares in the uh, in the post that we've uh, pinned on our Facebook page. We've also exceeded that. And we're now taking up taking it up a notch. We want to have 20,000 comments. I don't know we can do this, right? If there are a million, a million of us, now it's over a million of us. Uh, in this in this family, we know that we can certainly uh, reach and exceed that 20k uh, target that we have set out for ourselves. And you stand a chance of, at home of walking away with 500 rands in cash uh, when you participate. And all you have to do to claim the money is to be watching us live every single day. Halfway through the show, we're going to announce who the lucky winner is, and you have until the end of the show to raise your hand in order to claim the prize. If the person doesn't claim the prize while we're still on, then it rolls over into the money bag for the following day. Now, yesterday we had two winners. Unfortunately, only one, Semi Mahlatze, uh, whose birthday it also was, claimed the prize. So this evening we've got a thousand rands in the money bag. So if you know you've entered, you want to wait uh, to see if we are going to call out your name. That's some of the, so certainly some of what you can look forward to later on on the show. And of course, later on this evening, what you can look forward to as it is a Tuesday in Balinogo, bringing you the farming podcast at 8 p.m. And you can also catch her every single Thursdays with the same show where she always takes us through all things agriculture. Uh, you know, it is now spring. Spring has sprung. I'm also doing quite a bit of gardening and growing my own veggie patch, as you've seen on my social media platforms. You can follow me there at Zamandoma underscore K. So also getting great tips from Mbali's show about how I can do a better job at it, uh, especially because I want to be able to eat some of the food that I grow. So that certainly is a great show that I'm always plugged into. And of course, every Wednesday is Esti Klaassen takes us through the first time home buyers show, where she's always in conversation with people who've not only walked that first time home buying journey, but have gone on to grow their property portfolios from strength to strength. And Mondays and Fridays, Chad hits us with an amazing, amazing uh, preview of incredible properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.co.za. And they're so exquisite. Now, I often say that I wish I could do one of my shows in some of those properties. And I think we'll see. I think we must arrange maybe episode 350, you know, have a small little doing yana uh, in one of the great properties that Chad gets to see. Well, those are the great shows that you can find every single weekday at 8 p.m. across uh, private property social media pages. And of course, do follow us across our social media pages. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, uh, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok. If there's a social media platform, Platform, we are certainly there and catering to all of your property needs. And talking about those property needs, that actually, you know, leads us to our conversation this evening, which I am very excited about because this is one of those things that I, you know, follow very closely. I, I, you know, 
you know, part of my portfolio is some of the businesses I run, I uh, have an interest in this particular uh, topic. So I always love talking about it. And this evening, we're looking at why you should consider investing in student accommodation. And if you're in the student accommodation market, I want to find out from you, you know, are you an investor that's got whether one or more units in student accommodation? And if you don't, is it something that you're interested in? You know, what is it that you're still unclear about or wary of when it comes to student accommodation as a part of your property portfolio? But to help us better get a good sense of, you know, what we should look out for and even the state of student accommodation uh, right now, I'm joined this evening by Liz- Liesl Britz, who's the head of broking at Mid City Property Group. Liesl, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Zama. Zama, good evening. You know, Lisa, I think one of the big things before we even look at, you know, do's and don'ts and tips for people who are looking to explore uh, getting into student accommodation and some of the great reasons that I know that you're going to share. I think first, let's just look, look at an overview of, you know, the state of student accommodation, uh, the, the state of student accommodation market in South Africa, especially in 2021, given that we're in a pandemic year. Uh, I mean, I, I was even saying to you off air that I've spoken to quite a number of different landlords who have student accommodation units. Uh, from last year, you know, even this year. And obviously they're all sharing their experience of how they've navigated lockdowns and having to, you know, students leaving. So currently when we're looking at student accommodation markets, certainly from the area that I know that you're primarily in Pretoria, what would you say the state of, you know, the market is uh, this year? Yeah, it's true that um, last year actually was really bad. And I think the biggest thing, the major damage that were caused to the market was the uncertainty. We were so uncertain on when NASFAS would be paying. We were so uncertain on when students would be returning. Um, so that uh, besides the financial damage that a lot of landlords have incurred due to that. Um, but there are also some of the landlords that actually benefited from that, especially if you had a NIS, if you have a NASFAS accredited building, with your fundi system installed, most of those landlords actually collected those um, fundi cards from the students and they were actually swiping while sitting watching Netflix. So, um, and they had empty buildings and they actually mm-hmm. took the opportunity to upgrade their buildings and to actually um, take the time to make sure that the buildings are ready for the next intake. And I think um, what has happened with the academic year that was stretched up until end of March this year. Um, if you didn't have the cash flow at the end of last year, um, it would have been very difficult for you. But this year, the academic year started in April and it's obviously ending in November. So your concentration of money that are coming in now, um, you can actually cover the loss that you've had. But it is true that a lot of the uh, landlords that um, have huge cash flow setbacks um, but still, you know, for you to consider to get back into the market, we are still not very certain on what's going to happen next year. But what we do know is that the psychological damage for students and not only even just students, but any employee that um, are actually working from home now, the psychological damage that are caused are actually long term so bad and the um, all the institutions actually realized that it's impossible for a student to actually study from home without support without fellow, fellow students around them and if we just look at the circumstances that we have in institutions like um, TUT those students are actually from rural backgrounds they do not have electricity they don't have wi-fi it's not safe for them to actually sit with the laptop that they've been given, um, granted from government. Um, so they have to return back to campus. They have to come to these off campus accommodation where they have Wi Fi, where they have, um, suitable accommodation with furniture and, um, you know, the support with transport to classes and that. So student accommodation will, I think, forever be very, very popular and in demand. Mm-mm-mm. And, you know, Lisa, I think one of the, the, the big things that, uh, and, and I love that you've highlighted it, is that in as much as 
a lot of the universities have moved to you know online learning because of covid we also know that students need an environment where they're able to learn so you know the the fact that they're no longer going on campus doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there isn't going to be a demand for student accommodation it may be slightly different um, and if anything perhaps there might even be an, an instance where with certain universities i mean we haven't seen that yet uh, we might perhaps see that in the future where um you know student er enrollment figures increases because now it's no longer about you know having students physically come into class because capacity was often not only from a staff perspective but also from a, a lecture theater has you know 500 seats therefore you cannot suddenly enroll for example 1500 students for a particular program and yeah. i think with certain universities i know they're even exploring you know some kind of hybrid model for the future where they can also increase the staff complement so that they're able to you know deal with the bigger volume of students who are uh, potentially going to access their courses meaning that we're still going to have a demand for beds because one of the things that we knew pre-covid was that there simply went weren't enough university beds in south africa to cater for the number of students who needed them and this was even even with the you know residences the university residences and of course the private residences. So there was still this huge gap um, that needed to be filled. And I know that, for example, the Department of Higher Education, you know, always emphasizes those specific numbers when we would have enrollment at the beginning of the year. So it really is one of those pressure issues that uh, was a ticking time bomb in many ways, because we always used to see the long queues uh, with students requiring, you know, student accommodation. And it really is a crisis. Um, I think if anything, what COVID has now allowed us to do is to also just get clear on the kinds of services we need to be providing to students as you were saying that you know the, it's, it's about the environment but it's also making sure that they have the right amenities uh, for them to be able to work in the student accommodation versus for example um, if they are at home I want to find out from you at home if you are in you know student accommodation how was your student accommodation uh, unit or units affected during COVID and how did you recover because I think one of the great things is of course learning learning from each other and, and seeing what other people were doing. I know that there's some landlords who, when students went out, they, you know, started taking in young professionals for a shorter period um, because students, you know, said, look, we're going home. We don't know what's happening. And with some university school was, you know, suspended for a little bit. Um, and as Lisa already pointed out, you know, the academic calendar kept being stretched and stretched and stretched. But we're also now getting used to, I'll say, life in COVID and having to adapt to it. And, and so, making the decision around going into student accommodation becomes so crucial. So Lisa, for people who are considering going into student accommodation, because they're seeing the potential, they can see that, look, there's a shortage and there are properties on the market that are close to universities or, or in university towns, as we call it. I think what would first just be the, the, the key thing that they need to bear in mind uh, when it comes to student accommodation that would be different from if they were just doing a normal rental or let's say to a young family or even a young professional? So I think on a, a smaller scale, and I always, um, uh, Lucy Tumba Wai's um, video um, for the chicken farm, where he actually coaches people that come to uh, um, get funding, is to start small. And I see that often when, when um, potential investors approach us, that they actually want to jump for the really big buildings immediately. Um, and it's actually very dangerous to start off with a massive building and try and, besides the fact that you, the possibility for you to get funding on a massive building, a commercial building, it's actually good to start with a single residential flat yeah. and uh, in a good building close to a university and um, just rent that out just to, get into the industry to start learning about the behavior of students the you know their needs um your uh you know the, the timetables the fact that you're only going to get income for 11 months what do you do in your 12 month and um, some of the university only pays for 10 months and uh, there's often the the uncertainty about you know why do we get 11 months versus 10 months like you be normally students come in in fit and they leave in November, so that's a 10-month cycle. 
Whereas with TUT, they always come in in January because they come from rural areas, so they need time. So NISPAS actually also pays them on an 11 month um, cycle. So that's actually very beneficial for any investor to be paid over 11 months. So you've just got to like sacrifice that one month and um, prep them for the next year's intake. But um, like I've got my own properties as well, and you've got the choice to either furnish your properties for your students. The good thing about your single residential flats and taking on students on a small scale is you don't have to adhere to all the red tape that a larger building with, let's say, 100 mm -hmm. um, students or beds minimum. You, the minute you get your building accredited for NISFAS, then obviously you've got to adhere to all the red tape. You've got to go through the accreditation process. You've got to pay all those fees. You've got to get Wi-Fi in your building. You've got to get security on each floor. And um, you have to have laundry, transport, all of that. So um, I've got clients that actually invest in three-bedroom units and they place students, um, like six ladies in a flat. They do pay the body corporate a little bit more for the extra water consumption, which I respect a lot. Because um, in a sense, we'd see six adults or students occupying a three-bedroom flat as overcrowding. So mm -hmm. um, some of these investors are actually very good in terms of collecting an extra 100 grand for the water um, and, and pay that um, per head and pay that over to the body corporate. Um, and then they furnish the properties. They put a, a washing machine. Apparently, that's a big draw card for the lady, the female students. And they collect two and a half thousand rand per bed. So mm. that's pushing the, um, the income. You're getting double what a normal in, in, in like my properties, I'll get six and a half. Where if you put four students, then or six students, you get triple that amount, which is actually good. So, um, starting on a small scale to just learn about students and how they behave and then specific needs are actually what I would advise people to do. And I think banks also like to see a portfolio with students that you can prove yourself as a very responsible investor. Yep. Instead of coming in, trying to buy a, a building, a housing 50 students or 100 students and taking a chance, because this is not a Tatama chance type of industry. <laughs> You've got to be a very um, yeah. risk-free to the banks to consider you as an investor. That why why would the bank take a chance on you um, if they can maybe finance an uh, investor with very um, with a lot of experience with specifically student accommodation because it is a risky industry. Um, just as mm -hmm. the, uh, the investor himself would be a risk, but also with NISFAS and everything that has happened with COVID is an extreme risk to the banks now because they have burnt their fingers with certain investors that could not carry themselves throughout this period. So we, it's as if most investors are actually, we are yearning to get our buildings accredited with NISFAS because it's less risky. Mm. But um, we've seen now, um, especially with your um, UP students, that that was not the case, that they've left the buildings, we've bled as landlords, and... Um, you know, the banks do not want to take that risk. So with mm. commercial properties, we, we used to be um, getting finance on a 70% loan to value. Now we are backing to get a 50% to loan to value. Mm. Mm. I am this evening in conversation with Liesl Britz, who's the head of Broking at Mid City Property Group, and we're looking at why you should consider investing in student accommodation. I want to find out from you at home if you're investing in student accommodation, uh, how was it particularly, or rather, how is it, particularly now during COVID? Um, and I mean, it's the second year of us living in COVID, would have had uh, an, an opportunity to somehow plan for you know, more lockdowns and you know adjust the way that you're running your business um, relative to last year when, when it, of course, hit us without, uh, you know, any warning whatsoever. We're going to go for a quick break and see who the potential lucky winner of that 1,000 rands this evening for our competition is. I hope they're watching so they can claim their prize. And when we come back, we'll certainly get to the questions, comments. I see all the love that you're showing us on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll get to those in just a moment.
And the winner this evening goes to uh, Vyasha Naidu. Vyasha Naidu, if you are watching, I hope you're watching, drop us a message down here below to claim your money. A thousand rands is in the money bag. So you stand a chance of walking away with that 1,000 rands. That's Vyasha Naidu. If you are tuned in, then do make sure that you drop us a message in order to claim your prize. Now, I saw a few new names uh, that gave us some love and our Facebook page earlier on. Adeline bloom uh, is watching. Megan from Skalvek is also watching. Dumza Asimanye uh, is watching and, of course, showing us love on our Facebook page. Rifulwe Malibana, I see you there on Facebook. And, of course, the regulars, uh, who is a, a, a Varencia Pedachi, as well as Colin Janssen, uh, Fatima Simji, and Dogozom are also watching. Keep the love coming uh, there on our Facebook page. We absolutely love seeing it. And, of course, if you are in student accommodation i want to hear your experience with the student accommodation market especially this year you know had the, have there been any adjustments that you needed to make uh, to be able to essentially plan for the reality of operating in covid and knowing that perhaps you may not have as much demand because there were still some students who potentially didn't want to come live in, in student accommodation places or parents who didn't want their kids to live in student accommodation places. Or were you one of those landlords? Because I've also heard landlords saying, look, uh, my place stayed 100% occupied. And if anything, even after, you know, full occupancy, I still had students wanting a place and, you know, contacting us, um, wanting to, you know, get a, a bed. So if you're one of those, what are you doing right? I think do share with the rest of us so that we can um, get those notes. Now, Liesl, I think when we then look at, um, and, and I love that you've highlighted this and I want to bring it up, that if you're going or when you go into student accommodation, similarly really to any other kind of property, you know, class that you'll go for, you do want to start small. You don't want to start with a building that's suddenly going to have 50 beds uh, and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to gross, you know, 200K if I have 50 beds uh, and I'll maybe net uh, 180. These numbers look amazing in a year. I'll definitely be, you know, nearly a millionaire. Because it doesn't work like that. I think anybody who, who's managed even one unit uh, understands the value of learning from that one unit. And it, it can be something as pedantic as p putting in systems uh, in place for that one unit, maintenance for that one unit, managing that one unit, uh, and so on. So you don't want to bite off more than you can chew. And I think the, the fact that Lisa is even pointing out that banks are also now even more wary. So by the time you're wanting to look at 50 units, they do want to get a sense of, have you done this before? You know, they're not going to, to extend that line of credit to somebody who hasn't even managed, you know, two students, for, for instance. So you really do want to make sure that as you're navigating wanting to add student accommodation or perhaps start off with student accommodation uh, you you start off in small sizes because it, you you don't want to bite off uh, more than you can chew and now Lisa when we even look at biting off more than you can chew I think one of the big things of course there is around finances and and I think people sometimes don't have a sense of how student accommodation can sometimes cost you slightly more in certain areas than perhaps uh, you know a normal apartment that you might rent out to uh, or even a normal house that you might rent out to a family or a young professional perhaps just take us through what you should be budgeting for and how you should look at budgeting around uh, when you have student accommodation units sure um yeah i mean expenses on the one side is um something where we just have to bite the bullet because with student accommodation you've got the red tape and you've got all the list of requirements especially if you're going to go um, specifically, and um, I'm hammering a lot on TUT specifically. I'm not um, even looking at UP at this stage because um, they have a lot of student race available in Hatfield, specifically in Pretoria. So I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't recommend to any newcomer to the industry to specifically go for Hatfield because Hatfield is actually saturated and we've seen a lot of the students or landlords bleeding there because of the fact that um, only 25% of the students at UP are actually funded by NISPAS. 
So um, that gives you an idea of 75% of those students actually went home and they're studying from home now. So we're not too sure if they're going to return next year. We can't have that guarantee. However, due to the psychological damage, we hope that they do return. But one thing that we do know is that 98% of the students of TUT are actually on NISFAS accreditation or they get the NISFAS grant. So they have to come back to the student accommodation and the rest off campus here in Pretoria. And we're talking about the areas Arcadia, Sunnyside, Central, Pretoria, West. So um, we are quite certain that they definitely will return. So as I mentioned, you have to prove to the bank that you can actually, you can sustain the student accommodation and that you will be able to recover and, and pay your bond. So expenses mm. on the one side is something that we will have to do. So at TUT, it's expected from you as a landlord to provide transport, it's expected to provide Wi-Fi uncapped at a certain speed. It's um, You have to furnish your apartments and you have to maintain that as well. It's not like you're buying a microwave and it's now there and you don't have to replace it. Students actually break things and students actually use things and they sleep on the beds and you'll have to replace beds. Um, you'll have to pay your insurance. You'll have to, as I mentioned, the transport. So if you're not close to a bus rapid transit route or you can't piggyback on an existing route system, you'll have to get your own buses. Um, mm -hmm. You'll have to get insurance on those buses. So it actually accumulates. And we've done the um, calculation on these expenses. You've got to pay yourself for a minimum of 40% on that income. So at the moment, the income is 4,100 per student for 11 months. And you have to budget or a minimum of a 40% on that. You have to provide electricity, you've got to provide water, you have to provide the laundry services. So um, we we normally put measurements into our own buildings to prevent, um, you know, obviously students that are going to abuse the system where they mm -hmm. put in too many, um, you know, their friends come over for a shower, they cook there, they sleep there. So you've got to have a proper... Um, system where you control the access to your building. It's also a nice local system for the university. So if a student is not clocking in at uh, university, they will come back to you as a landlord to check if the student have actually um, been to the building, what have they worn, um, lost. So you've, you've got to have a CCTV system at your building as well for the safety of the students as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got a budget for at least a 40%. So um, your expenses on the one side is one thing, but you can't afford to have vacancies in your building. Mm. So we often um, walk with um, investors through our own buildings to show them and we actually um, tell them exactly what mistakes we've made. So we try and teach investors to um, not make the same mistakes and what to expect more or less in certain buildings. Um, especially if you've got a mixture of students between different universities, like your UP students don't want to mix with TUT students, whereas your TUT students wouldn't mind mixing with any other institution students. So you've got to prepare yourself for things like that as well. But just back to the vacancies, you cannot afford to have vacancies in your building. And with any business, like if you think how many second-hand car dealerships we've got, if you look at all the salons, we we actually the, the the market will never be saturated with salons, but mm. if there's a salon with a better offering with specials or a new product or a new service or whatever, we go for it. Um, I mm. think student accommodation is very um, sensitive in terms of location, so you'll funny enough find students that don't want to be close to the main TUT campus. They actually want to be in the buzz in Sunnyside closer to the clubs and that. So, you know, so you wouldn't, I, I would think that I would want to be close to the main campus where I study. However, the students actually prefer both. You'll have some mm. students that prefer to go into a building with a lot of rules and regulations. And other students actually want buildings where there are no rules and regulations. Um, but you'll also have a high failure rate in that specific building. 
But I think if you think about the needs of a student, and I mean, I've, I studied at TUT as well a long time ago, and I was, I, I was fortunate to study on campus. We had mm. a house committee in our building. We had um, like a house mother and father, like a mm. caretaker in the building. Um, we were close on campus. Um, we had sport activities. We had beauty pageants. We had socials. We had church outreach. Now, if you look at a student accommodation race off campus, the private accommodations, they actually don't provide that. And if you want to stand out as a landlord, a very successful landlord, without any vacancies, you have to look at, at what the students on campus are being offered and try and present that into in your off-campus building. So mm. if we just look at the connection um, with on-campus activities, like your sport activities, you can maybe partner with other um, off-campus building landlords and say, let's let's form a um, soccer team amongst our buildings and we um, provide transport for those boys to go and compete with the, the on-campus race soccer teams. Let's um, create a sobriety feeling in our buildings where we create we we um, create this opportunity for them to actually have their art displayed on the walls. Let's provide a wall for them to take pictures of their social activities so that they create their own alumni so that they can come back in a few years' time and say, this is what we had. There's my picture. I, will, I belong to this family. You can actually be so creative because how I see the buildings, you have a building full of clients. Let's say you've got a building with 400 students. Those are actually clients that are in, um, they are potential car buyers. They are potential, um, first time, uh, bank account clients for a bank. They are potentially, um, opening, uh, taking out a cell phone contract. So mm. you can actually invite the service providers to your building, give them a nice space and a spot when the students are coming in with their gazebo. They can, um, present their products and services, but you want something as a landlord back from them. You're giving that, them that advertisement. So they can maybe for all our graduating students, give us free cell phone or open a bank account with a 5,000 rand savings account. For the bank, that is an amazing opportunity to catch that student at a young age. I still got my standard bank account that I opened at university. I can clearly remember I went to a gazebo and I opened my bank account there. So it's a massive opportunity for service providers to benefit, but it's also for you as a landlord to benefit. Let's say you get Vodacom in. They can sponsor your your students' T-shirts and caps with your building's name printed on the back of the shirt, and that's your work, walking advertisement on campus to ensure that the students are actually coming back and they feel that they belong. They, they've got this pride that they in a building with a nice name. So that's the first advice I would give as well. If you've got a big student accommodation building is change the name. Because some of these buildings have the most boring building names and you can actually give them a nice name like Mazabuka or Majuba or something like that that's completely more relevant and painting different colors for you to stand out. And if you are planning on um, buying more than one building, give it a signature. Change your signage and make, um, make it your signature. Like city property, all their buildings have the same um, signature outside. But city's buildings all have um, the name The Edge. So we'll have Flowers Edge and Festival Edge and Campus Edge. So that makes you stand out mm. as the landlord and you'll actually attract these students to want to come and stay in your building. And I think, you know, one of the things is definitely clear, Lisa, is that we're going to have you back on the show uh, to look at student accommodation best practices and, and even to share some of the mistakes and learnings, I think, as, uh, you know, Mid City that you've picked up. You were saying earlier that this is something that you, you know, even do for investors who are keen on getting in the market. Uh, because one of the things that we also know about property is we, we, we want to all succeed, right? You want the different buildings 
buildings in the block to also uh, be fully occupied, be run well, uh, as opposed to being vacant and potentially end up being run down. Uh, and so really it is in everybody's best interest when, especially if you look at university towns, when as different landlords, we are running our respective uh, you know, buildings or certainly accommodation units well and servicing our students well. Um, I want to share a quick comment here coming through from Semi Mahlansa on Facebook saying, I'm one of those running private student accommodation. And last year and this year, it has been tough for us. But uh, with the little number of students we are having, it is better to keep our expenses covered till we can go back to normal life. With the, uh, with the number of COVID-19 declining and people getting vaccinated, we have hope for the next year, even though some TVET colleges are already saying they will only have two trimest, um, semesters, that is only putting us in a very bad condition. And I think, you know, it is one of those things, as I said before, that, that a lot of the landlords are also just wanting to, at the very least, cover their faces. Uh, I think student accommodation it was one of those uh, areas of property where you you enjoy very high yields and and i think for many years landlords have typically have you know enjoyed higher yields and now you're having to say okay let me at the very least cover my expenses just so i can stay afloat and and weather uh, essentially this covid storm uh, lisa before i let you go this evening because i know that we've already run out of time what what final you know tip would you give to somebody who's still considering potentially getting a student accommodation unit, particularly now? So they're probably obviously uh, going to purchase it for we'll say for the next year because it will probably only register, of course, later on in the year. So they've got their eyes set on you know owning that first student accommodation unit for the new year. What tip? can you give to somebody who is still eyeing? So they're not in yet, but they're still considering getting into the student accommodation market. So um, I think if you, if, you go, if you want to go for the big buildings, if you've got the capacity to go for the big buildings, I think you definitely have to put in a lot of effort in your marketing. Because in the end, the student can still choose where they want to go and stay. And the intake is normally, um, and we're expecting it to be in Feb next year as well. So you have already got to start now with your marketing campaigns to get your building out there. So if you're going to go for um, NISFAS accreditation, you, 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 the, the TUT is actually starting, they're opening up for accreditation now in October. So mm. you must be prepared to have your building ready and to have your um, apartment your mock-up apartment furnished so that when those um, the accreditation team come out to do the accreditation and the inspection, you've got to be ready for that. You can't be caught with your pants on your knees and be too late because if you miss it this year, you've got to wait until the next year. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But marketing is the major thing. You've got to be out there. You've got to make sure that your gazebos are ready for January, when you when they sit there at TUT, you've got to have your online exposure. But that's with anything like that. If you're not, if you don't have an online presence on social media platforms and that, you can't expect students to actually know about you, because your mm. building once it's accredited will go on that. They've got a new website, T R E S T R E S, and then there's the TUTEC Res website as well. But T R E S, this is a platform where students can actually comment on your building, they can complain about your building, and they can actually also compliment you as a landlord. So getting your building ready for um, that that website and your social media platform to get the word of mouth, mouth out there, that's certainly one tip that I can give to all land, landlords out there when you start to get that fixed from the start and network with people, network with the, with the SRC, Network with the different mm. companies out there. If you're going to start in the industry, learn from whoever has done it. Learn from their mistakes, not to burn your fingers. Because student accommodation is actually so risky that it can wipe out your complete portfolio if you make mistakes. Because if you've got a big building and your building is not on the TRS website or something like that, you've got a 100% vacancy and that can floor you as an investor. Start small. Mm -hmm and do your marketing.
Mm. And I think that's such a great note to leave it on. Start small, learn, rather pay your school fees with one or two units than, you know, biting more than you can chew uh, and, and then paying, you know, the kind of tuition you absolutely might probably not even be able to recover from. Uh, Lisa, we're going to leave it there this evening. I'm already, you know, calling it. We're definitely going to bring you back on the show later on this year because we want to be able to get a sense later on in the year on what people already are in student accommodation should be doing. I mean, you've already highlighted one is that you want to start marketing early. uh, And I know already towards the tail end of the year, it's already a good place to start marketing as early as then because there are still students who want to confirm their accommodation before they actually, uh, you know, go back home over the December period. And so not everybody is going to be searching for accommodation in January. Some actually want to have already viewed and decided before leaving. So later on in the year, we're definitely going to bring you back to get a sense of what we should be doing uh, in the event where we have student accommodation units to get ready for the new financial year what should we have in place and if we don't have it in place now what are some of the systems that we need to put in place but for now we're going to leave it there Liesl thank you so much for joining us on the show thank you Zama thanks for the opportunity good night and that is Liesl Brits, who's the head of broking at Mid City Property Group, uh, bringing us to the end of this evening's private property podcast with myself, Uzaman Dungwa Kumalo. Now, the team has let me know that unfortunate, unfortunately, Viesha Naidu has not claimed the prize. So it will be rolling over tomorrow to 1,500 rands. Remember, if you know you've entered, you want to make sure that you're watching us live because if you call your name, you have to drop us a text in order to claim that prize. Well, I've always stayed my welcome. Uh, you can, of course, look forward to Mbali Nwago on the Farming Podcast at 8 p.m. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow at 7 p.m. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.